Welcome to a very busy New York City. You can uh, see in the background, you can probably also hear all the noise. Now, while I'm here in, uh, in New York, a lovely thing happened, of course. Today is the release of GPT-5, so OpenAI. You get the chat GPT-5 chatbot, and you also get access to the GPT-5 model. It's going to replace all the other models, so all the other models are deprecated. And I absolutely couldn't wait. I mean, it's been minutes that I've had it available, and I couldn't wait to make a video about it. Remember what we're doing in this channel, we're checking it out for data science. So we're gonna do some statistical analysis. So I'm just gonna to stick to what I've done in the previous couple of, week, uh, couple of videos, and I'm gonna have a data set, and it's just gonna be about sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive values. So there's just gonna be a simple data set. Remember just the two columns. The first column indicates whether someone actually has the disease, binary variable, and then a new diagnostic test. Does this test indicate that the disease is, is, pos uh, is uh, present or not? So that, that just comes back positive and negative. So very simple, it's just gonna be positive, negative predictive values, uh, sensitivity and specificity. And then right at the end, I wanna change the prevalence just to make sure it uses the law of total probability to do that analysis for us. So look down in the description down below, I'll link the video uh, that I've made using Claude, Claude uh, 4, and that actually worked very well. So what are we trying to do here in data science? In data science, uh, most in my research group, most of what we do is just in Python. That's the, the majority of the work that we do. But we do create Jupyter Notebooks because Jupyter Notebooks are beautiful research documents. If anyone wants to look at that data analysis, you know, months, years down the line, there's the bit of a research document. It also allows us to write code and then write normal sentences, titles, subtitles, anything that you want to put inside of these research documents. And that's just, uh, it's just the way to go. So what we're testing here is to create an agent. So we're gonna make an instructions file that tells the agent what to do. And then we write a prompt to tell the model what the analysis are. So the instructions are there for the creation of this. Remember, I'm, I'm not gonna do anything. Everything is written, all the code, all the analysis, all the interpretation, that's all done by the agent. So you'll see me use the agent mode inside our Visual Studio Code, which is the number one IDE for me at the moment as far as data science is concerned. So, you know, let me know in the, in the comments if you want to see a video about how to set these things up. So it's going to be Python. I'm going to instruct the agent what to do, and then I'm going to write my prompt telling the agent all the analysis that I want. Now, I'm going to let the cat out the bag because in the end, or maybe I shouldn't, at the end I'm going to say something about is this better than Claude or not. And, uh, you know, the analysis is going to be spot on. I'm just you know, curious as to what the notebook looks like that's going to be generated. I think by now we can all accept that it writes pretty good code. And I don't think ChatGPT 5 is going to be better than anything done before because what has come before has done this little experiment for us. And maybe now it's time to change this and, and do something slightly more, slightly more interesting than just this, uh, the metrics, the, the sensitivity, specific, positive, negative, predictive value videos that I always make. But I'm curious, have you played with ChatGPT or GPT-5? Now, what are your thoughts about this? And do you use agent mode, you know, to do your, to create your, your, your notebooks for you and do the data analysis? I think that's just the modern way to do it. And it's just absolutely fantastic. You can verify that all the code is correct yourself. You can change that research document. It just saves so much time. So we're not gonna wait. I'm gonna show you uh, my Visual Studio code and we're going to use GPT-5. So after restarting my Visual Studio Code, you can see I have GPT-5 Preview now available to me. So this is an empty project. The only file I have in here is my usual metrics.csv, comma separated values data file, contains the data that I want the agent to analyze. So what I'm gonna do immediately is just click on a new file and let's call it chat GPT-5 testing .ipynb, a Python notebook. Enter and we see that it is open. Now, we can get Visual Studio Code to do this for us automatically, but what I do like to do is to set up my own virtual environment. So I'm immediately gonna select kernel. Right at the bottom, I see Python environments. I'm gonna say create a new Python environment. And we're gonna create a virtual environment. And then I'm gonna choose my Python 3.13.5. So again, instead of the agent doing this, I'm just going to hold down shift, hit command or control on a PC, hit P, and I'm gonna say, create a terminal, a Python terminal. 
and you can see that virtual environment's right there and I'm going to just pip install some of the uh, some of the modules or packages in Python that I think that is going to be required. Once again, you don't have to do this. The agent can do this for you. So I've gone for NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, Seaborn, and Stats models. So there we go, it's installed. Once again, you can get the agent to do this. It might be that the agent does want to use a module that I haven't installed here now. So please, if you know, you're not familiar with these steps, you can just skip them. As I say, I do still like to do this manually. I do like to, uh, to create my own virtual environment. And remember, that's a carbon copy of Python. You can see it entered right there. Do you see that on the top left? There was no .ve and v there before. If I do open it, you'll see there's a bin binary folder. And inside there, there's pip. And um, down there, there's Python. This is the version of Python that's going to run. And it only runs within this folder. I'm not using my system Python. This is a copy of it, a virtual environment. And that's just the best way for you to use uh, a Python in, uh, in data science. So now let's just close this down, give us a bit more space. What I want to create is my instructions, the instructions to the agent. Let's click on a new file. So I've created a new file and I've called it getup.instructions.md. That's where we're going to add these instructions to the agent. So I'm going to copy and paste this in. Remember, it will be down in the description to this video. You can just copy and paste it yourself. And there we go. We've got a little YAML preamble there. So that's the dash, 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 or minus, minus, minus on your keyboard. And I'm going to say apply to colon and then notebook inside of quotation marks. So the agent would know that this is, applies to a notebook, a Jupyter notebook. And I'm using a bit of HTML. So there's a single hashtag symbol there or pound symbol that just denotes, you know, title, so this is the title of my instruction set that's called Notebook Instructions. And then you'll see these little star symbols all the way down. That's just bullet points. So I'm going to say start all notebooks with Python code, percent config inline.backend figure format equals retina. That's just so that we have high definition plotting because this is a retina display. I'm going to say use clear and descriptive title for the notebook, use markdown sections, etc. You've seen this before. Again, you can pause and write this yourself or just look down in the descriptions as you go down hitting the subscribe button and the like button you'll just go down a little bit further after you've done that and you'll see uh, you'll see this so that's my instructions to the agent i'm just going to save that great let's get back here and uh, we are ready to generate code we're going to get the uh, the agent to generate this code for us so that we will put those instructions we'll just put right in the chat bot here. And again, look, I've got agent selected and I've got GPT-5. Now you can see chat GPT-5 testing.ipymb, that's in the context, but I'll also have to tell the agent about this instructions file. So let's hit add context. I'm going to hit on instructions and then we can see we have our instructions there as well in the context now. So I'm going to copy and paste my, uh, my prompt. And there you go. You can see the metrics.csv file in this folder contains data on an experiment to determine the sensitivity, specificity, and the positive and negative predictive values of a new test for a specific disease. A total of 322 uh, participants were selected. Again, scroll down in the description. If you didn't do it before, that's the subscribe button and the like button. And leave a comment. Just leave a comment and tell me what you think of uh, of this way of working with data science and what you think of the new chat GPT or GPT-5. So again, down in the description, you can read through this. I've given the, the, in the prompt all the kind of analysis I want. I say calculate and visualize the frequency and relative frequency of each class in each of the disease and the test columns, create a contingency table of the two columns, etc. So remember, I am in agent mode and I've selected GPT-5 preview as my model. And all I'm going to do now is, oh, let's hit that uh, send button and let's see what happens. And you can see the agent at work. It's found that uh, data set and it said reading the rest of the CSV to capture entire data set, continuing to read the remaining lines in the CSV file, getting notebook structure so we can insert analysis cells properly, adding structured analysis cells. Oh, I can't wait to see what happens. Ah, there we go starting to populate our notebook. Remember, I'm not typing anything. The agent's doing all of this. So now it's handed uh, power back to me and it says run notebook cell. 
I'm going to say continue, but I'm just going to click down there and say allow in this workspace. As you can see there, it decided on pandas, numpy, seaborn, and matplotlib. So my luck is in. Those are exactly the modules or packages that I didn't stall. If you didn't do it, it will come up here now and said, you know, would you mind if I install this for you? And you're just going to say yes, allow in this workspace. Comes up with a little message. Copilot has been working on this problem for a while. May it continue? Yes, of course you can. Okay, it seems that it's done. I'm going to say keep. So let's give ourselves a little bit more space and see what happened. I'm just closing down my sidebars. So there we go. Diagnostic test performance analysis. That's great. A little description there. Ex experiment evaluating a new diagnostic test versus gold standard uh, disease status. 322 as far as our sample size is concerned. We see that it's done the figure format there using that magic command config inline backend dot figure underscore form format equals retina. Then it's done the imports of what it thought it would need. It's reading the metrics.csv file. It's saying the length is 322. It's just checking. Oh, that's great. Look at there. We see the first couple of rows of our data set. So there's only the two columns, disease and test. So the disease indicates by the gold standard whether the disease is present, yes or no. And there's this new, ne new, this new test of ours. So in that for that first uh, subject, the disease was actually absent and our new test came back negative. In the second one though, the uh, subject actually had the disease but the new test came back negative. So you can see uh, our data there. Then it's going to go to uh, a little nice little uh, subtitle there. Section head frequency and relative frequency distributions. And it's done all that for us. Look at that. Uh, 262 without the disease, 60 with the disease. So that's 18.6% prevalence there within our data set. I think this data set was generated, remember, such that the by the gold standard, this is reflective of the prevalence of the disease in, in the community. So where you can see the proportions as well. It says something here about a future warning. Something has been deprecated. Remember, that's part and parcel of, of uh, working with Python. There's always new versions and things get changed in these packages. And you know, a couple, it's just warning you that a couple of uh, you know versions down the line, some stuff is going to be deprecated. That's all fine. We see beautiful bar charts there, both of the frequency and the relative frequency. Uh, disease for both uh, for both the disease and the test results. Great. Interpretation, the data set contains 18.6% or 60 or 18.6% 16 or 18 diseased and 262 or 81.4% non-diseased participants matching specified prevalence. The test yields substantially more negative than positive results, reflecting the low prevalence and reasonably high specificity. So there's our contingency table. It's going to make a table for us of, uh, of what has happened here. We build a 2x2 two two table of disease status versus the test result. And so the 233, they did not have the disease and the test result was negative. So that's true negatives. And the right bottom, it's put the, uh, the true positives. These people have the disease, yes, and they test positive, yes. And then we can see all the uh, false positive, false negatives uh, on the cross diagonal there. So the table tells us true negatives, false positives, false negative, true positives, etc. Now let's look at the joint and marginal probabilities. That's very nice. It's just telling us again... Um, these uh, joint probabilities. So that just takes every frequency divided by the sum total. We see the row marginals there. Again, those with and without the disease. And we see the same for the test results. 77% tested negative, 22.9814% uh, uh, tested positive. So we can see that nicely. Now, I mean, you can see the interpretation there. Everything is, uh, looks good. Sensitivity, specificity, positive, negative, predictive values. It's telling us there, true positive, false positive, true negative, false negative, sensitivity at 75, specificity at 88.9, positive predictive value of 60.8, and negative predictive value of 0.9395. As we would expect, the prevalence is quite low. So if a test comes back negative, you know, we, it's the, there's a 93.95% probability that uh, the subject actually doesn't have the disease. But if the test comes back positive, there's only a 60.8% probability that the subject actually has the disease. And that is nicely explained here. NPV about 93.95, a negative test result is highly reliable, etc. And then 61% truly have the disease, limited by prevalence and the false positives. Exactly correct. PPV and NPV, in my prompt, I said, well, what would happen if we change the prevalence to 40%? And so it's got to use the law of total probability 
When calculating the positive and negative predictive values, remember that's not going to make a difference to the sensitivity and specificity, but it is definitely going to make a difference to the positive predictive value and negative predictive value. Remember, that is what we do when the test is already done and the results come back. What do we do with that information? As opposed to sensitivity and specificity, which helps us decide whether we want to use the test or not. So there it says, well, uh, this is what we get at, uh, at a 40% prevalence. The PPV increases to about 81.9%, while the NPV decreases to 84.2%. A higher prevalence raises the prior probability of the disease. So a positive result is more likely to be a true positive, And that's just what you expect. I mean, if there are more people within the community from you know which these subjects are taken, if that prevalence is higher, of course, if a test comes back positive, you, you're going to put uh, you're going to put more emphasis on that result. And it's explaining there to us why the prevalence affects. And then a nice little summary. So here's my verdict. I think this is very, very good. Absolutely, absolutely great. Does it look as good as the Claude 4 agent? Oh, I've still got to give it to the Claude 4 agent. That Claude 4 agent created a, a better looking report for me. Um. So, yeah, I think it's all, almost there. So I think what we need to do is create a few more videos, just, you know, push the envelope a little further and see how ChatGPT 5 is going to do. I think in a test like this, of course, they are going to do well. These models, even Gemini is going to do well. It's not going to, it's probably not going to make mistakes. Of course, you've got to look through these lines of code yourself and just make sure sensitivity times prevalence, sensitivity times prevalence, Plus one minus specificity, one minus prevalence. Yeah, that looks great. That is the using the law of total probability to calculate the PPV. So you just got to look at that code, of course, and never just trust what these agents are doing. So, uh, you know, I would give very high marks to this. This is brilliant. It's written the summary and conclusion. It explained everything nice. I, I, I still want to give it just to, to Claude. Um, and just that, that report, remember, just... Check down below. I'll put a link to that video I made uh, a while ago just using Claude 4. I think, uh, you know, this is close. It's totally acceptable. I, you know, I think everything is done. Everything that, that uh, I put in the prompt was done. So I'm curious. Tell me about your experience with using GPT-5. So the chat GPT-5, you can open the chatbot, maybe upload a data set like this, do it directly in the chatbot. But, you know, hardcore data science, we want an agent to populate a notebook for us. This thing, you know, I can alter it the way that I want. I can add, you know, more verbosity to it, make it look slightly better. So when I share this with my research group, you know, this is a beautiful living research document. And that's what you've got to do in research. You've got to have these research documents. Tell me down in the comments. What do you think of GPT-5?